Let's go to Luke chapter number 16. We're looking at unanswered prayers in the Bible. And this is one of many. And um, we're going to look at the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man and Lazarus. Luke chapter number 16. Let's read the whole story because it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense just to pull out verses here. But we'll read verse number 19 starting verse 19, Luke 16. Let's pray first. Father, would you please take the study and bless it to your heart, bless our hearts with it. We ask, dear God, that you'll help us to realize the great truth that you'll show us tonight in your precious word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Can you imagine the pallbearers there? How about that? The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off, Lazarus in his bosom, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And beside all this between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. The prayer from hell. In fact, I think that every prayer in hell is unanswered. I believe that every prayer in hell is unanswered. In verse 24, the rich man prays for water. In verse number 27, he prays for a witness. Neither of these prayers that he prays in this passage of scripture is answered. Now I'm gonna give you three reasons why the rich man's prayers were unanswered, even though we know that no, no, nobody in hell that prays have their prayer answered. First of all, in verse number 23, we're going to find out that he prayed in the wrong place. Too late to pray now. Verse 23 says, and in hell, and in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torments. Now listen, this is not a parable. This is a real event. This really happened. Because in a parable, God never uses proper names. He uses Lazarus. He uses Abraham. But he, he, he never uses uh, but in, when, when, when he preaches on a parable or teaches a parable, he'll say a certain king or a certain man or a certain nobleman or a certain person or whatever. But he prayed in the wrong place. He had the, he had, first of all, he had the witness of wealth. In verse number 19, look what it says. He was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared. Here's a word that's found only here in the Bible. He fared sumptuously every day. The word sumptuously means dazzling. It means, it means a brightness, a brilliant splendor. It means, it, it means that he was flamboyant. You ever meet anybody like that? And, uh, but we, we would say something like this. He's doing pretty good for himself. That's the old hillbilly saying there. But he fared sumptuously, not, not just on days, but how, how often? Every day, every day. Romans chapter, two, you, you, you say, what do you mean he had the witness of wealth? Well, let me show you in Romans chapter number two. Hold your place here because we're coming back. Romans chapter number two. And let's look at verse number four. Romans two and verse number four. 
If you're in the habit of taking notes, Romans 2, verse number 4. Now notice what he says. He says, or despiseth, despiseth thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, knowing, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. God says a man will repent if he'll just take a look at God and see how good God has been to him. Now, <clears throat> sometimes we try to scare people into heaven by telling them they're going to hell, and that's truthful. Listen, you're being truthful when you tell a lost man that he's going to die and go to hell if he doesn't repent and get saved. But sometimes we fail to tell them something like this. You know that God's been good to you? Do you know that God has blessed you You've got a home, you've got a job, you've got, I mean, if a person is in that kind of a shape that he's, I mean, just everything seems to be falling in place. But why is it that the more somebody has, the more luxury they have, the more riches they have, they don't think they need God. But the Bible says here that the goodness of God, God's been good to people, but the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. God obviously had been good to this fella. He fine linen, fared sumptuously every day, and it's not a sin to be rich. But we better recognize where our blessings come from. Look at verse number five. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasureth up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Now a person that that has it good, and the person that God's been good to, he's accumulating treasure, but he's accumulating the treasures of wrath if he doesn't trust Jesus Christ as his Savior before he gets saved. Then in 1 Timothy chapter number 6, you may want to jot this down as a reference. I'll turn there and read it for you for the sake of time. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 17. Verse 17, Paul says to Timothy, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches. Are riches certain or are they uncertain? <laughs> They're uncertain. They fly away, don't they? They says, it, or nor, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, look, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. The Bible says that he reigns on the just and on the unjust. God is good to the, God, listen, God is good to the saint and God is good to the sinner. He's been good to all of us. Amen. Well, he had the witness of wealth. This rich man did. And then he had the witness of a wretched beggar. Now, outside of his gate, as he would look out the window, he saw that wretched old beggar laying at his gate full of sores, and the only friends that this beggar had was the dogs. The dogs came by and licked his sores. Now, I, I heard of something. I don't know how true it is. This is just an old West Virginia tale, I guess it is. They say if you got a sore on your hand or your finger, just let a dog lick it. It'll get better. Is that what they did? I, I think that's true. Amen. If I get a sore on my finger, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to put a Band-Aid on. I don't know about getting a dog to lick it. <laughs> but he had, this rich man, he had the witness. Now we're talking about what he saw here, what he had. Had the, had the witness of wealth. He had the witness of a wretched beggar. Every time he looked out the window, he saw that beggar. That beggar was still there. You think that played on his mind any? You think that before he went to bed, before he retired at night, you think maybe he thought, well, if I get up in the morning, I'll look out that window and that, I bet you that beggar's going to be there. I, I personally don't believe that beggar kept quiet. I believe he witnessed to that rich man. That opportunity was there for the rich man. Every day that rich man would, would ignore that beggar's witness. Every day he would ignore that beggar's needs. 
He wouldn't do anything about it. Every day that rich man missed the opportunity to get right with God and to help that poor beggar out. And so we see here, he had the witness of wealth. God was good to him. He had the witness of that wretched beggar. That's something else he had. He had the witness of the word. In verse number 29, look what Abraham said unto this rich man. Talking about his brothers here. Abraham saith unto him, they have his brothers. He's talking about his brothers, they. They have, not had, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Had the witness of the word. Now I would say, and I don't, I don't have anything to, I don't have any scripture to back this up, but I, sometimes I just like to use my imagination a little bit. I think out of respectability for his name, I believe this man went to the temple. I believe he went to the synagogue rather. I believe he heard the law. I believe he heard the prophets, but he just did not heed the law nor the prophets. And so I believe that he knew the word or he heard the word by the way, so God had been good to him in that he gave him his wealth, had a beggar there to tell him about Jesus, heard about the law and the prophets. God had been good to him, but he's praying in the wrong place. Too late now, too late. And he not only prays in the wrong place, but he's praying to the wrong person. Look in verse number 24. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, Father Abraham, and we'll deal with that a little bit, okay? Father Abraham, somebody answer that. Tell them, tell them we're having church, all right? Look at verse number 24 again. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. Now, here is the significance of that little phrase, Abraham's bosom. That phrase was used by the Jewish people to denote, a, to denote paradise. And th it, this was the place where the faithful went after death. Paradise was later on caught up in the heaven. And Paul went to paradise, remember that? And he came back and he could not even tell what he had seen, what he had heard. He didn't write a book about it, didn't make a movie about it, make some money. Like a lot of people say, well, I went to heaven and here's what I saw. Listen, you can swallow that if you want. I'm not going to swallow that one. If Paul went to paradise, if Paul went to heaven, and it was not lawful for him to tell what he saw or what he heard, I think I'm going to take Paul's testimony over somebody who's trying to make a buck. So we have this, this phrase, Abraham's bosom. And why would he call him Father Abraham? Because it seemed natural to the Jew to look to Abraham as the father of their nation. And God did make Abraham the father of many, many nations, he says. He was the father of their nation. He was the friend of God. He was a great man of faith. So they would naturally call Abraham their father. You'll find that in John chapter 8. That he talks about their father Abraham. But notice it says Abraham's bosom. That was the choicest position at a feast. Remember, who was it that leaned on the bosom of Jesus? Wasn't it John? And so John leaned on the bosom of Jesus because it was the most honored place. So we have the significance of Abraham's bosom, but then the Savior is the only one who can answer that prayer. He prays, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. He prays, send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this, in this flame. Now, whether saved or lost, one must go to the Father through Jesus Christ, his son. And you cannot just go to God and expect God to answer prayer if you bypass his son. If you say, I believe in God, I believe in the Father, but I'm just not too sure about Jesus. Well, forget about praying because your prayers will never reach any farther than what comes out of your mouth. I, Mark gave me this the other day and I kept this and I, I, I want you to read, I, I want you to listen to this. This is entitled Prayer. Can I read this, Mark? Prayer Before Confession. Now listen to this prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, into my soul. Enlighten my mind that I may know the sins I ought to confess. And grant me your grace to confess them fully, 
humbly and with a contrite heart. Help me to firmly resolve not to commit them again. O blessed virgin, mother of my redeemer, intercede for me through the passion of your son, that I may obtain the grace to make a good confession. All you blessed angels and saints of God, pray for me, a sinner, that I may repent from my sins and that my heart may be forever united with yours in eternal love. Amen. You think that prayer reached God? I don't know who it reached, but it didn't reach God. Jesus not even mentioned. Virgin Mary is. The saints are. I'm just telling you, whether you're saved or whether you're lost, whether you're non-religious or whether you're religious, if you bypass Jesus Christ, your prayers will never be answered. Never. Well, we have he prayed in the wrong place. He prayed to the wrong person, but he prayed for the, he prayed for the wrong prophet. Now, the Bible says, what would it profit a man if he should gain the world and lose his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So look at verse number 24. Verse 24. Verse 24, the Bible says, And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he, this is his prayer, first prayer, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now, first of all, he asks, he prays for water. Now, that's very interesting to me because, now, 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 now look, he's in hell. He's in flames. He's in torment. He is obviously very, very thirsty. But a very interesting request, because seeing how previously, listen, seeing how previously he would not even allow Lazarus to touch him. As he would come and walk down by the gate where Lazarus lay, I can imagine he didn't pat him on the head or shook his hand or anything. He probably avoided him like a plague. I'm not getting near that guy. I'm not going to touch that guy. But now he's in hell and he wants Lazarus' finger to be put into his mouth with a drop of water on it. He said, well, what does that tell you, preacher? I, here's what it tells me. Those who don't know Jesus Christ, those who don't know Christ, most of the time, most of the time, they'll have nothing to do with you. They don't want you near them. They don't want you talking to them. They don't want you sharing scripture. They do not want your gospel track until they need prayer. And then they'll say, when you go to church tonight, and I know you go, see, they watch us. They know. They know when prayer meeting night is. They, they, they watch us as we get ready to go to church. Would you say a little prayer for me? Really? You don't want to have anything to do with me? That's what you want to say. You don't want to have a thing to do with me. Now you want me to pray for you? I tried to tell you about Jesus. I tried to give you a gospel track. You tore it up in front of my face. Jerry Walsh told us about a fellow that he gave a gospel track and the guy ate it. Remember that? Remember he was here? He told that. But now when they get in trouble, when they're sick, when they hear that they've got cancer, when they've got a few months to live, now they want prayer. What is our obligation, preacher? We need to pray for them. They need to be saved. It's very, very, very important. But here is Lazarus, sores all over him, maybe even on his finger. And he says, send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger and Put it in my mouth and touch my tongue with a drop of water. You ever stick your finger in a cup of water and raise it up? You know what you have? One drop. And it just kind of hangs on there, doesn't it? And so they despise us and they hate us and they want us out of their sight. And when you try to witness to them, they won't have anything to do with you. But one day they will need you. And they will want you to get a hold of God. 
the rich man was still selfish. Now think about this. He was selfish before he died. He was selfish after he died. He was selfish because he only wanted something to, allevi to alleviate his pain. Now when you see his prayer here, not one time do you pray, does he pray, oh God, get me out of this place. He doesn't even pray that. Prays for a drop of water, prays for a witness. Why? He knows he can't get out. No use to pray that prayer then. He can't get out. Now, suffering punishment in hell does not change their character. Turn to Revelation. We'll come back here to close here in a second. Turn to Revelation 16, if you would. Suffering punishment in hell doesn't change their character. Revelation chapter 16 and verse number 21. We're talking about the great tribulation period. Verse 18 says in, in chapter 16, verse 18 says there were voices and thunders and lightnings. There was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. The great city was divided into three parts. The cities of the nations fell and great Babylon came and remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away and the mountains were not found. Watch this. And there fell and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven. Every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail. For the plague thereof was exceeding great. You would think the wrath of God coming down upon man, that, that man would say, I give up, I, I give up, I'm, I'm, I'm confessing you as my Savior. Save me, help me. But instead they blaspheme him. Look at Revelation chapter number 22. Revelation chapter 22, verse number 11. Revelation 22, 11. Verse number 11, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. That's eternal security right there. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. You see, when a, when a man, a lost man dies and goes to heaven, his character, his demeanor, everything goes to hell with him. If he has lust in his heart on this side of the grave and he dies, he'll be lusting in hell forever. Whatever his character was when he died, that's the way it's going to be when he's in hell. If he's a murderer and he dies without Christ, he'll want to kill people while he's in hell. It's too late. You can't kill the soul. You can't kill his spirit. Suffering punishment in hell doesn't change their character. A man's heart must be changed. And it's got to be changed on this side of eternity. Too late in hell. Too late when this life is over. One more thing. He asked for water and then he asked for a witness. Verse number 27, back in Luke 16. Verse 27, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would ascend him. That's Lazarus to my father's house. For I, have five, for I have five brethren. You got any brothers tonight? You got any? For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Time's running out. That's what he's saying. Time's running out for my brothers. Time's running out for them. Who knows when it, it's going to be their turn. Too late for me, but time's running out for them. And so he says, Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto, them, unto him, if they hear not Moses 
and the prophets. Neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Perhaps this was the first time he was ever concerned about anybody but himself. He's in hell. He's praying for water, can't get that. He's praying for witness, can't get that. He's praying that he gets some kind of relief for his suffering. He's in torments, he's in pain. Too late. Water would help, but not very long. <laughs> just a drop he wanted. He didn't want a glass. He didn't want a pitcher. He didn't want a gallon. He just wanted one drop. Water would help and a witness from a man raised from the dead won't help either. Now let me show you something that I realize here. Now who's he saying? Who is he wanting? Who is he wanting Abraham to send? Lazarus, right? Let's go to John chapter 11. We know what happens in John chapter 11, right? John chapter 11, Lazarus is dead. If, if we're talking about the same Lazarus. John chapter 11, Lazarus is dead. And Jesus comes and he does what? He raises him from the dead, doesn't he? In fact, he had been dead how many days? Four days. And by this time, the Bible said he stinketh. I mean, the maggots started working. <laughs> how many of you didn't had supper? Amen. <laughs> so in John 11, he raises Lazarus from the dead. But then in John 12, in John chapter number 12, verse number nine, now remember the rich man says, Abraham, father Abraham, send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I'm tormented in this flame. All right, now look at verse number nine. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. Now watch. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death <laughs> the second time. <laughs> because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. So he says, send Lazarus to witness to my brothers, lest they come to this awful place. And Abraham said, they have Moses and they have the prophets. If they don't believe the word of God, they're not going to believe one that rose from the dead. In fact, they wanted to kill him, didn't they? They wanted to kill him. But I've got news. One did raise from the dead and he's alive forevermore. And I'm telling you, if they won't believe Jesus, they're doomed. They're doomed. They'll be just like this rich man. And in hell, they'll beg for water and in hell, they'll pray Go see my loved ones, lest they come to this place of torment. So here's what I'm saying. He had his prayers unanswered, didn't he? In fact, he probably knew that before he started. So in closing, the place to pray is on earth. The time to pray is right now. If you're lost, tomorrow may be eternally too late unanswered prayers of the Bible. Father, we ask your God that you'll help us to realize the truth of this great story that you told in your word. How a man that you have been good to, that you gave him his wealth, gave him his health, Lord, gave him everything that he needed as a witness but yet he turned it down. He didn't give you honor and glory for the wealth that he had. He would sidestep Lazarus, would not even try to help him. And he neglected the word of God, the law and the prophets. And he's in hell as we speak tonight. Too late to pray. Father, if there's one here tonight that doesn't know Jesus. Right now, it's not too late to pray and ask God to forgive them of their sins and to, for them to trust Jesus tonight as their Savior. There should be one here tonight. I pray that they'll get their heart right with you, go to you, 
Pray in the name of the Lord Jesus to save them from their sin. Give them eternal life. Father, help us to realize how important this story is. For we all have loved ones that need to be saved. We pray now that you'll do what you need to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Nobody loves me like you love me, Jesus. I stand in awe of 